kind of trusting, trying to be aware of where the other cars are because, you know, one of the guys was a weatherman. You know, it's like nothing against weathermen or anything like that. But and there was a couple of young ladies there, um, although they did really well. But I just thought, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure any of these people have ever faced the wrath of a yellow checker cat. <laughs> Welcome to another edition of the Talking About Cars with Randy Cardoon podcast featuring the one, the only Hot Rod Bob Beck, because everybody has a car story. Today on the program, you know, Bob, we are going back to the beginning, how the we very are. first Talking About Cars began in 2014, Ooh, 10 years back. ago. That's right. Back, back in we, the olden days. I I think it's a crazy world. Not only was it at a place that uh, is known as a hotbed for racing in Southern California, but certainly at the once a week home of the one, the only Hot Rod Bob Beck, Irwindale Raceway. Now, that first show, when I was still doing radio in Los Angeles, we uh, featured uh, basically all sorts of interesting stories. And we talked about a celebrity race. Celebs getting yeah. together behind the wheel, going after it. And our first guest on the show is someone you guys, I'm sure, know. Uh, yeah. He was a young actor uh, early on. He, of course, has uh, grown older. And he has come back. And he's now on, I think he's on a show on NBC. He's been on a multitude of shows, that being Mark Paul Gossler. You may remember him. He was my very first guest on Talking About Cars back in 2014. Well, this time... We turn the not so way back machine to last year's 2023 race, where once again we reached out towards the Irwindale Celebrity Circuit. And our guest today, actor D.B. Sweeney. Yes, he finished fourth in that year's event. And we will get behind the scenes on how that all came about and his car history, as we always like to do with uh, some of our guests. So, Bob, that, and again, they've been doing the celebrity race at Irwindale for a long time. Yeah, I think since the track opened up, they were doing, uh, you know, circle track and trying to attract people. And how do you attract people to a facility they don't even know exists? Well, mm -hmm. you bring in celebrities they do know, and it worked. That that and that we tried that on our show, and uh, we you certainly do. got a good start. So that was a lot of fun, and we had some great people. And the fun thing about celebrities, in many ways, aside from the publicists and all the other people that they have around them. They're just like regular people. They have car experiences like you do, except maybe they can afford better cars. <laughs> maybe, maybe in the hey, beginning, look, yeah. Look, look, look at that! Come on, I, I mean, in my garage. Yeah, that's a nice car, and that's the beauty yeah. of what we do. Is the cars we have are really cool. They're not exactly brand new. They're not Lamborghinis, but there are some people that have it. And if you like cars like we like on this show. Uh, they're, they're always fun and there are stories that come from it and how you got it, unusual oh, yeah. things about it. So that's going to be a lot of fun to bring him in. So, yep. we'll and we also have something, uh, I think from DB might be able to give us about something that could be news in the future. If things happen the way he hopes oh. it will happen. Oh, then there we go. There I am being cryptic. Yeah, that's it. Ah, listen so, for more information here on Talking About Cars. In mere moments, right here on this Talking About Cars channel. Uh, in fact, have you, when was the last time you uh, PA'd a celebrity race out there? I know, I don't think you did the most recent no, one. You, you know, I don't do the celebrity races, so to speak, because I'm on the, primarily on the drag strip. I'm not on the circle uh -huh, track. Right. So, uh, you know, celebrities, now I take that back. We, we have had, uh, a very well-known ventriloquist. You may have heard of him. Jeff Kreskin. Dunham. No, no, yeah. no. Yeah, no, 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 no. Uh, but Jeff Dunham bought oh. one of the brand new Challenger 170 models. Right. And they, they brought him out to Irwindale to try and teach him a little bit of how to drive it. And he was able to pull the front wheels up off the ground. This is a stock vehicle. He got all the accessories. He even got the passenger seat, which is an option. And he put a parachute on the back which is also a factory option. And he was able to go down the Irwindale drag strip, front wheels in the air for the first oh, 20 or 30 feet. And man, it was fun to watch. Wow. Who does he think he is? Stacy's mom? You know, he's going to compete. You know, if, if Jack Beckman doesn't work 
work out with John Forrest, they're going to look at Jeff Dunham. Uh huh. No, not really. But <laughs> yeah, that would be interesting if he did yeah. that. That wouldn't that be fun? So. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, there's all sorts of things going on. If you're in Southern California, you could check it out at Irwindale, as well as uh, speedways all around uh, the United States. Uh, there's a great yep. raceway up here, Pacific Raceways. I don't know if they do celebrity races, but I know they certainly have some great racing going. In fact, we've done several uh, episodes on stuff happening there. I think the most recent one we did was the uh, story, oddly enough, with a neighbor of mine who ended up having... Uh, the decision of do I drive a challenger race car or do I drive a EV Tesla? Oh. Yeah. And the funny yeah. thing was he drove this, the challenger and uh -huh. didn't win, but the Tesla he raced and he's, he was at last look in Las Vegas going for the national championships of the bracket racing. So you just never know how those stories are going to work out. That's true. That's All true. right. So, again, let's bring him in. A guy who uh, is a celebrity racer. And I'm curious whether or not he, this is his first attempt at it, or is this something he really always wanted to do? I, well, I think he, that's interesting. Well, you know, I, I, I listened to an interview with him on another station, and he got his experience driving race cars by being a taxi driver in New York City. Thank you. Hey. Hey, I mean, how many of us have been in New York City and and yeah, experienced yeah. a driver like that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. One of these days when we have time, I'll explain the part where we did that. And the guy blew the engine right in the middle of our ride. That was that was and I was sharing a cab with a family from Minnesota trying to get to the airport. That's it. What, by the way, it wasn't D.B., I no. I, I'll, I'll, I might bring it up during the show, but I, it wasn't <laughs> him. I like that story. He can maybe he can share more light on that. So let's He'd bring him in. Did. He's he's standing by a movie career, a TV career spanning decades. You know him. Let's bring on our guest, actor DB Sweeney, and there he is, ladies and gentlemen, the one the only, live from a place in this country, the one the only DB Sweeney on the Talking About Cars podcast. Thanks for joining us, man. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great to talk to you guys. You know, it's so great that you were able to uh, get, a, get and join us on this show because we do a lot about celebrity racing. And I think a lot of times people don't realize there are so many celebs who race that there are others that you don't know race. And I think you've done so much in your acting career where you, you were played a hockey player who eventually did all sorts of other stuff figure skating, all sorts of other things. You were in Eight Men Out. You you played, of course, in that movie back in 88. You've done sports movies before, but I'm curious, how did it come about that you ended up getting behind the wheel of a race car? Are you a NASCAR fan? Do you race normally, or is this just a thing? I am a fan, but this, this particular uh, charity race came up because Swampy Marsh, who's one of the co-creators of uh, Phineas and Ferb, and a good friend of mine, our kids played hockey together. I've known him for many years. He was involved in this charity. And he said, hey, you want to try this? And I said, well, you know, I'm a former New York City cab driver. I think I could find my way around an oval. <laughs> and uh, so he brought me out, and it was a lot of fun. Hey, I told you, Randy, he got his experience driving in New York. Yeah, well, that'll give you experience right there. All right. Strange. Did you ever have any really strange taxi cab rides where things kind of got a little crazy while you were driving? Uh, yeah, 100%. You know, I was a young guy. I was at NYU at the time, and, and uh, I was driving a checker cab right at the end of checker cabs. And a lot of the drivers were, you know, unlicensed. Like, they weren't regulated like they are now. Like, people would use their brother-in-law's hack license or whatever. You know, newly arrived people would just jump in who didn't speak English. So there were times when you'd have little fender benders, and, you know, normally you'd jump out and try to say, hey, what's going on? Let's exchange information. And they would just take off. So, you know, I had the checker, so I won every collision anyway. Yeah. So it wasn't really a problem. And they would be in like the newer cars and, and they, the, you know, with the bumpers that crumpled the way Detroit designed them. And, uh, but the checker cab was, uh, I think it only loses to a Sherman tank in a bumper, in a bumper to bumper. Yeah, I think yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. I think. That, that body style stayed in production for decades. And it just made the front bumpers bigger because you got to get people out of the way. Yeah, it was really well designed. I mean, it was it was built for urban warfare, and then that's what it was that's what it was utilized for by me. Wow, 
That's interesting. Once I went there and we were trying to get from Long Island to the airport and not only did the car's engine blow up during a taxi cab ride, but two other guys came by and tried to steal his fares and then they got into a fisticuffs and we're just like, okay, well, this is interesting. And then, so we ended up on a bus and then the bus happened at a terminal and these two guys started getting into a fight. And I went, well, this is so intriguing to find out how the transportation department in New York really, really works. You are from New York. And you, you, I, I read a story about how you learned to get rid of your New York accent. That's true. Uh, Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, this casting director, uh, Lou DeJamo, who was, uh, you know, a very famous casting director in New York in the 60s, 70s, 80s. I met him as a young actor, and uh, I sounded, you know, that TV show Entourage, I kind of sound a little bit like E, you know, uh, Kevin Connolly's character sounds on that show. And, uh, you know, very thick Long Island accent. And I went in and had an audition with this guy, Lou DiGiamo, who's a big Italian guy, 300 pounds with a cigar. And I, I finished my audition. And he goes, uh, kid, you're very good, but you don't look like you're from New York, so you can't sound like you're from New York. <laughs> and I really didn't know what he meant, but I knew it was good advice. So I took a, I took a pencil. I had this speech coach. And I put the pencil in my teeth, and every night I would read Shakespeare's sonnets and try to read them as clearly as I could with a pencil in my mouth and try to read them with no accent. And it took two years, but uh, after a while I could not only not have a New York accent, but I could do other kinds of accents as well. So it was just kind of hard work and, and uh, trying to get rid of it. And it was good advice that I finally understood when I saw The Sopranos, because he was saying to me, you're not going to get hired for The Sopranos. You're going to get hired for the cutting edge. You're going to be the guy from Minnesota. You're going to be the guy from Canada. You're going to be the guy from Texas. You don't look like a New York Italian Greek guy. So there's going to be limited roles for you in that world. And he was, it was very good advice. See, once again, you learn more than just automotive knowledge and car stories when you listen and watch the Talking About Cars podcast. See, this is, this is something we give you as a public service. All yeah, sorts of is. interesting stuff. I, so you grew up there you also moved on what was your first car let's just go back to the start my first car was uh, i was just out at nyu and i was living in hell's kitchen in a really really crappy dangerous yeah. walk-up apartment before hell's kitchen became you know uh, like it is now it's very bougie uh -huh. um, but back then it, was, it was one of the worst ghettos in new york and uh very dangerous uh one of, we had a guy murdered on our, in our front doorway. Like we didn't have a doorman or anything. Obviously, just a buzzer door, and there was a guy killed right there. And oh, so a lot of a lot of adventures. My brother and I were roommates there. So anyway, I started um, wanting to go out, get out of New York City, like go to the Jersey Shore, go to the beach or something, back to Long Island where I'm from. But I didn't have any money, so I bought this car. It was a, an orange uh, Volkswagen Rabbit, and boy, was it a piece of crap. And <laughs> You could park it anywhere and nobody would bother it. So I'd park it out on 12th Avenue or something like that. And then I left town once for about three months and I came back and it was gone. And I, so I went to the cops and I was like, hey, I think was my car towed? And they said, nope. And I said, well, then somebody must have stole it. And I said, nobody would steal that piece of crap, not with all these good cars on the road. And the, <laughs> the cop told me, no, sometimes they steal really crappy cars because it's more, uh, you know, if you want to do a robbery, you roll up in a Bugatti, you know, they're going to be able to say who, who drove away, but you roll up in a crappy orange rabbit and people might not notice you. Did you, did you yeah. ever find out what happened to the rabbit or? It never turned up. It disappeared into the vortex of memory. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the rabbit escaped. That's a rabbit. different approach. Yeah. <laughs> the first good car I had was when I moved to LA a few years later, uh, I bought a 1965 uh, fire engine red Mustang coupe. And mm. that was probably the best car I ever had. It had no air conditioning, though, because in 1965, I guess, you know, uh, people were tougher and they didn't need it. But driving <laughs> around L.A., and especially the valley in 110 degree weather with no air conditioning, trying to go to an audition and not show up like you just stepped out of a steam room. I, I, I you know, I had to get another car. So uh, I, I had a great love affair with that car for five or six years. Unless your okay. role really meant you needed to show up looking like that, then it would have worked yeah. for you. Yeah, I'll tell you what, some post-apocalyptic role, I probably would have got it. There you go. Yeah. There so you go. Yeah, method acting, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the first, car, the first new car I bought was I was back living in New York again, and it was uh, uh, an Alfa Romeo Spider, uh, fire in, uh, what was it, Veloce Green. Um, and it was a convertible, and it was just the coolest little car. 
And I, you know, I was making a little money then. So I got a garage in New York and this is almost 30 years ago. The garage in New York was 400 bucks a month. And I was like, I have friends out in Texas and places around the country that are paying less than rent than I was paying for the rent for my car. Oh but my gosh. Worth every dollar. And I just had so much fun with that car. I had to go get it. The, the color I wanted was only available in Falls Church, Virginia. So I flew down to Dulles Airport and got a cab to Falls Church and picked up my car and drove it back to New York. And I love that car so much. Do you still have it? No, I let it go. I was When I was driving around LA, I started playing golf a lot and I couldn't fit the golf clubs in the trunk. So I was like, something's got to give. So yeah. I'm not a total guy. I'm a one car at a time guy. What do you have now? I actually just bought a, a Toyota 4Runner. And uh, so I, I, uh, I, was, I had a friend of mine who's a mechanic say, I was like, look, I'm so sick of all the maintenance on all my cars. What's the one that has the least amount of maintenance? He said, well, Toyota or Lexus, those two. And I was like, well, I'm not a Lexus guy. I, I'll look at this Toyota. So I got one. We always ask people, uh, what is a car that might have gotten away that you wouldn't mind having back? Is it an obvious question to answer with the uh, Alpha? Or, or is there something else that you've had in your past that you wouldn't mind getting back someday? Well, my one of my best friends in high school, Scott Lashier, who went and joined the Marine Corps and became, you know, he's a great American. He's, he, you know, we're still friends. Anyway, he had, when we were in high school, a 1956 Chevy Bel Air, uh, red and white. And, you know, we rode around that thing. And he was obviously, he was a Marine from the time he was born. Nobody brought a soda <laughs> into that car or a beer. Or, you know, that car was pristine. And I just remember riding around in that and thinking, you know what, this is what it feels like to be the king of the world. Wow. What about station wagons? You like those? If they were that uh, era, I'll tell you what my 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 dad was a school teacher, so we never had a new car until I was a, a junior in high school, and then finally our first new car. I had three siblings, and you know we were always my dad was school teachers to make much money, so paycheck to paycheck, and and uh, but he got this Plymouth Fury station wagon, first new car in the family. He brought it home a week later. The engine dies, like which doesn't happen in a new car. So anyway, they tow it back to the dealer, and my dad. Is pretty livid with the guy and you know he's like how do you sell me a car that's like this so to mollify my dad at that time suffolk county long island the police cars were plymouth furies not the station mm -hmm. but they had the supercharged i think 440 engine that the police cars had right. so the guy to mollify my dad he said i'll throw the 440 in there for you and and you'll have a really fast car and it'll be great for you and my dad said yes and so that was the car i learned to drive on so you know we would, I would go out on uh, william floyd parkway which is a long stretch of uh, uh, North South Highway in Long Island, and they would block off uh, the exits. The exits are like two miles apart. We'd have watchouts, and we would drag race out there. And I used it <laughs> as a spectator. But the one time I show up at the station wagon, and we hustled these guys and said we could beat you with the station wagon, and they had no idea and just beat them on a quarter mile like it wasn't even close. Uh -huh. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, Bob here has a 56 yeah. wagon. So, yeah. Yeah, I do. I don't know if you could pull that up. Can you pull that up? Yeah, I've got a 56 that... Chevy. Yeah. I can try, yes. Yeah, let him try pulling that up for you. Just a little show and tell here as long as we're playing around with that. Here's that vet behind you, Bob. Yeah, that's two his. It's a 2003 anniversary edition. I, ha I actually have two. We've got the convertible that you see here, and then uh, we've got a coupe. I love that color. Thanks. Yeah, it's uh, anniversary red. It's only one year, and we uh, actually just – came back from Bowling Green, Kentucky, where we caravaned with 500 of our newest unknown friends. The Corvette Museum. Museum. That's right. We went for the anniversary, of, 30th anniversary of the Corvette Museum. You know what? I've driven by that. My son was at Alabama and I was living in Chicago. So I've driven by that museum the last six years, like 20 times. And I've always been, you know, you're always, I'm always trying to get from Chicago to Tuscaloosa or back. And it's right in the midway point. And yep. I wish I had stopped, but I will stop now that I live in Nashville. I'm going to get there. There you go. Yeah, it's only uh, it's only about an hour and a half drive or so from there. Yeah, I got to do it. Yeah, that's the beauty. Look at that. How about that? And, huh? And and I tow a 1955 camper trailer with it. Oh man, that matches, and we have fun with that. The wife and I go camping from time to time. I'm not much of a camper. Uh, she's more so than I am, but uh, we meet some great people. Everybody thinks they're the coolest guy at the campsite until you roll up with that, huh? Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, all we do, all we do, is vintage camper jokes. Oh wow! So uh, we're we've got one of the the newer, I guess you could say, combinations 
but there are guys that have uh, you know, older vehicles towing vintage trailers that match. Of course, the car's been updated. Ours has been updated too. It's it's Corvette powered and it, it's got disc brakes and all the good stuff. Uh, but yeah, it, it, you know it's fun and it's great camaraderie. We made a lot of friends. And the reason we did the trailer is we went to a car show one time, and we're used to car shows. Yeah, look, don't touch. And then we got up to a vintage trailer, and we're looking like, you know, we're car guys. And the guy says, no, 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 go inside. We go, really? Go inside? Yeah, you can touch it and take a look. And the people were completely different in their attitude. So my wife said, well, we got to get a trailer. So this was a, an eight-year project, and uh, we got it on the road, and it, we have fun. It, it's great. We've met a lot of great people. That's amazing. You know, talking about Corvettes, my, my new movie, Megalopolis, which just came out this past weekend, the openings, Francis Ford Coppola, who directed The Godfather, Apocalypse Now, all these movies, he's an, a big car guy. Like, he directed the movie Tucker. You know, he owns, like, four Tuckers. Um, and we had two of them in the movie. And so the movie's kind of a weird setup. It's, it's kind of like modern New York meets ancient Rome. And there's all kinds of, like, old cars and new cars. So he's got, like, uh, you know, there's I think there's a Tesla in there. But there's a, a 1974, I think, Corvette right in the early, um, in the first scene of the movie. And then the main character, Adam Driver, he drives around in a Citroen uh, limousine the whole mm. movie, which is a beautiful, you know, car, you know. So anyway, Coppola is a big car guy. And so I think car people will really enjoy seeing the movie, the way he's integrated, you know, all these kind of classic cars into the movie. Uh, Megalopolis, it's uh, playing in IMAX right now. I'm taking oh. note of that right now. Megalopolis. Yeah. Megalopolis. In movies now. Okay. See, guys, you're, you've got your uh, marching orders. Go up to check that movie out and check out the cars, too. Wow. Yeah. Now, he, he didn't use any of his cars in there, obviously, right? He did. Well, no, he did. Uh, yeah. He, oh, he's he did. He's, the Citroën belonged to him. He has at least two of those. And the Tuckers belong to him. And I think there's only like, I don't know, there's less than 100 Tuckers in the world. There might be less than that, less than 50. They only made 50. They only I made think. 50. Yeah. yeah. So I think of the, of the 10 or 12 that are left, he's got two or three of them. Wow. So yeah, he's a, he's a buff. Wow. Very cool. I, I think uh, that that's gotta be a must see just because of the cars for heaven's sakes. And of yeah. course, everybody has a list cars that you would like to get someday. If, if we said to you, DB, here's some money, go get yourself the car you always wanted one or two or five or whatever, name a couple of cars that you would jump on like tomorrow. Well, I, I always loved the El Camino because I felt like as a little kid, it was my favorite uh, Hot Wheel, and it had it was like the best of both worlds, uh, like a car and a truck. But now that I'm growing up, I realize it's actually the worst of both worlds because it's not really <laughs> a good truck, it's not a very good car, but it's still super cool. You know what I mean? It's like I, so. I think if I had a really uh, uh, you know decked out El Camino, that would be number one. Um, when I did the movie No Man's Land, which was about Charlie Sheen and I stealing Porsches, um, I was offered a Porsche from the 9-11 people, but I was like, no, I drive too fast. Uh, I'll put that thing on a tree. So thank you, but no thank you. I thought it was one of those gift horses that I had to step back, you know, that I thought a bunch of Greeks would jump out of it and kill me. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I didn't I didn't take that one, so, but I really wish I had taken that one. I, I actually liked the earlier, that was 1987. Those Porsches in that era are cool, but I think the 70s Porsches are cooler. They're a little smaller. They're a little more, I don't know, European looking maybe is the right, I don't know. So those are two, and then, uh, I mean, it's, I really love the, the Lincoln Continental that like when I first started in Hollywood, you know, they'd pick you up in a town car. And I, I always thought that was like such a cool, elegant car, you know, and, and, you know, I felt like when I'm getting in the back of a Continental, I feel like, oh, you know what? I've arrived. So yeah, <laughs> those are three that come to mind. So the El Camino, does it matter what year? No, uh, no. Beggars can't be choosers. I'm ready. <laughs> Just go for it. I got it. I go. I got it. Okay, so let me let me speed forward a little bit. So you're racing in this event, and I happened to look at the video. I think it's floating around. You can see it on YouTube. Uh, you go ahead and look for Celebrity Race Irwindale, and you'll find the actual race call, if you will. And did I notice you you started? I think uh, in the number five spot on the uh, when you started, and when they threw the flag down to start going. Did you immediately hit the hit the gas and try to pass somebody on the side? Yeah, well, I was a little sour because we had trained for three days. And on the first day, I got in the car, and they had let the car sit out in the hot, 
light, you know, in the sun. And it was so hot. You got the flame proof suit on and the helmet and you're very restricted. And I was very claustrophobic. And I was like, oh, man, I hate this, but I love Swampy. So I'm going to stay with it. And then we got out on the track and I was like, oh, I like this. I actually like this a lot. And the second day we got in the cars and they were in the garage and it was like, ah, oh, this is good now. It's a cool thing to start with. Uh, not so burning hot. So then the third day of training, they gave us a big speech because the guy who owns the track and owns all the cars, he's trying to raise money for this for the charity to help find a cure for the disease that his daughter suffers from. So he gave us a speech where he said, listen, last year, or the year before, somebody put one of these cars in the wall and that cost sixty thousand dollars. And that meant that we didn't raise any money for the charity this year. So I know they didn't really mean to do it. But if you guys could just really be careful with the cars, I know your competitive juices are up but just kind of take it easy. So that was the third day. What they didn't say was they were tracking our times that day to slot us in the race. And on the second day, I had been the fastest guy, but I was like, okay, I'm gonna take the advice. I'm gonna step back. And so, and, and anyway, so on the third day, I followed the rules, which is never a good idea. And I ended up getting <laughs> slotted fifth. And I'm thinking, well, this is not a long enough race for me to catch all these people. So I gotta have to go back to New York City cab driving techniques. And so, yeah, I just I did everything I could. And I finished third, which is a pretty good accomplishment. I had the fastest lap of the race, which was a good accomplishment, but there was just no way to catch those guys with that big head start. Yeah. Yeah. They, they had a, the top two guys uh, actually did have a pretty good start on you. Uh, the soap opera star, Thad Luckenbill, and of course, Swampy, who you talked Swampy. about, they were, they were neck and neck to the point where I hate to say it because when you watch NASCAR races or any race, you're always looking at the top two guys, but you never see where everybody else is unless there's an accident. Right. So we did not see your car. We wanted to get your car up here, but we could never find a good shot of it because they were always concentrating on these guys. Front oh, well. runners. Yeah, exactly. Talk about being front runners for heaven's sakes. So you remember what your lap times were? Uh, I want to say I had one right around 20. Okay, so you figure it's a half mile track, yeah, 20 seconds. Uh, I think top speed 100, 110 maybe top speed because it's not that long, you got to start slowing down in the corner. Yeah, if you were doing one minute laps, you'd be doing 60 miles an hour. No, no, you'd be doing 30 miles an hour. So if you were doing 30 second laps, you'd be doing 60. So yeah, you were you were doing probably close to eighty. Yeah, I think that is including the speed on the on the turns. You got to get it yeah. down like fifty or something. But I love the whole thing. That short track in the beginning was kind of frustrating because yeah. you couldn't really air it out. But at the same time, you're more actively driving than if it was say a mile track. I think. But I'd love to do something yeah. else. Do it again. I got, I was hooked after that race. That was so fun. Well, you got plenty of areas around there to do that, and uh, you can even go up to that Corvette Museum we talked about, and they've got a track they'll put you on. Really? Yeah. yeah, but you have to have a Corvette, though, don't you? No, no, they'll provide the Corvette. Wow. Oh, they'll give you it? Well, they don't South give Carolina. it to you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, that's right. Go I ahead. went to the BMW uh, Proving Grounds in Greenville, South Carolina, and drove out yeah. there. And they're, they're, they weren't about speed. They were about precision, going around cones and stuff. And uh, I, I, I just brushed one cone, and the guy yelled at me. And I was like, what are you yelling at me for, man? It's... <laughs> Trying to have the fastest time, you know. It's a call. It's not, wasn't a wasn't a baby carriage. <laughs> those no. those BMW guys, they can be really sticky. Mm. Yeah. How long did it take for you to get used to you being in the car? Because, like you said, it's kind of claustrophobic. It's not like you have a rear view mirror. It's not like you know where everybody is. Did they have guys talking to you on your headset to try and explain to you where you're, when to move and when to try and change lanes? Yeah, one of the really smart things they did was from the first day of uh, practices, you have a dedicated guy who's your guy. So he's kind of learning your style, your communication skill and all that stuff. And he ba we basically learned after the first day, it's like, don't coach me along. Just tell me important stuff. And that was and that worked out great. And so, yeah, he would say, you know, uh, you're good. Uh, Ten more feet. Go, you know, hit the brakes like he was. It was pretty good. And but he after a while, he just let me go. And I was better just doing it kind of instinctively because. I think my technique wasn't exactly the classical way they were doing it. And I was, I was kind of coming in hotter and going down lower quicker. And so it was a little, I was kind of trusting, trying to be aware of where the other cars are because, you know, one of the guys was a weatherman, you know, it's like nothing against weathermen or anything like that. But there was a couple of young ladies there, um, although they did really well, but I just thought, you know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure any of these people have ever faced the wrath of a yellow checker. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, you're probably right. Yeah. Well, okay. So I just happen to have a list of the uh, people in the race. I want you to give me a short uh, opinion on how they did or what kind of racers they are. For example, uh, we'll start off right off the top. Uh, you and Steve Howey, who's been in, uh, a well-known actor. He's been in several movies um, and television shows. And, and so he's in the car. He's going basically back and forth with you for third place. So what kind of driver is he? I thought he, he did a good job. You know, I mean, we're both obviously trying not to wreck the cars, but we're both trying to get up to the lead also. So uh, I thought he did a good job. And, and uh, you know, I'm not, I don't know technically how to describe you know, his technique, but, uh, you know, I, I thought he was a, a fun competitor. Yeah, he had apparently did a thing at the end of it where he uh, opened a couple of Coors beers and, and basically downed them both <laughs> at the same time. I was, I, I don't know about his That's technique, but that technique really Special. impressed me. I don't know. Special skills, yes. Uh, let's see. Uh, Adrian Paznar, you, you know him from being in other movies with him. Yeah, Adrian's an old buddy, and I always say this about him as a race car driver. He's a very good sailboat captain. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> very good. Uh, you, you mentioned the young ladies, Anna Ferris. We all know her from uh, movies and TV. Anna Ferris surprised me. She was, uh, you know, she was very uh, focused, very competitive. Um, she was fun to be around. I really, I really enjoyed her. Yeah, she says she's gonna at least on the video. She said she wants to come back and do it next year. So they didn't do it this year, but if they come back in 2025, maybe you, we'll see her do that again. Uh, Amanda Rigetti. Amanda Rigetti, who, who's really good in the movie Reagan, by the way, she plays Ronald Reagan's uh, mom, and uh, she was terrific. You know, I mean, it's uh, it's very hard to be chauvinistic about these two ladies. Uh, at, you know, I, I want to make every kind of joke I can about woman drivers, but neither of them qualify. All right, very good. I think he just got out of that. I think he just got out of that really kind well. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'd just, say. But they're still women. You yeah, know. well, don't go there, uh, Bob. You, need to, there. you need to uh, not sleep on the couch tonight. That's right. Uh, if I say any more, mm, couch time. Uh, let's see. What, what about Swampy? He's a guy that's been racing for a while. Yeah, I mean, Swamp, Swampy's clearly the most skilled guy. And, uh, you know, he's really smooth. And, you know, he was. The, I thought he was the guy to beat. But uh, but Thad surprised me. And, uh you know, he was he was balls to the wall in, in a great way. And uh, I'd love to have another shot at him. Yeah, they, they did very well. And there were some other people in there as well we don't have to go into. But it, it was fun to watch because at the end, you guys had such a good time. And that's that's the one thing about these races that are so much fun. Racing a car, to me, in my experience, has is just – it doesn't matter if you're a celebrity, if you're just a regular guy, if you're an actual race car driver. It is such a, an experience and an adrenaline rush. It really is. It's great. And at the end of the race, everybody was so pumped up, and, uh, you know, it was like a hype show. And, and uh, the one guy who was, uh, I thought, MVP of the, of the end of the race was uh, Cristo Fernandez from Ted Lasso. And I said I got a, I got him on a video saying to me, "Racing is life." So I thought that was uh, <laughs> as as good as it gets as far as a tagline goes. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Very good. And by the way, I'll, I'll throw this in because I I know him, but uh, Frank Buckley, who's the uh, local news guy down at uh, Channel Five KTLA in LA, he uh, finished dead last and said he intended to do that. So I think that was a nice bit of uh, nice bit of placement as far as uh, uh -huh. kind of doing that yeah he was uh you know i think he's a regular at the charity and he took to heart the advice about you know not breaking the cars and trying to get the money to the charity and uh just a nice guy to be around yeah, and mark Krisky also he is uh the weather guy down at channel five and uh, again he's been doing that for in fact we were talking about the fact that when we first started doing talking about cars when i did it the first thing we did for our first episode is we covered the celebrity race in 2014 so we talked to Mark Paul Gosseler. We talked to a bunch of other guys that were doing it. And, it. and it's similar to what you guys have all gone through is you get a guy who's in there who really gets into the car thing. In fact, what is it about actors, per se, celebrities somewhat, but they, they just aim for racing? Is it the adrenaline rush? What is it about people like that you know you're talking you're talking paul newman for a long time frankie muniz patrick dempsey james garner Stephen queen these are all guys established that just went like a moth to a flame when it came to racing yeah jason Priestley's a friend of mine he's into it too uh, he actually had a serious crash really damaged his foot 
Um, but I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think part of it is as an actor, you're, you're sort of like the place kicker on the football team. Like everybody needs to block and do their thing and get your position. And then you come kick the field goal or the extra point. So at a certain point, you're very dependent on all these other people. I think the appeal of racing or, or some people are interested in being musicians, being out front of a, of a band. I think it's sort of like, you're tired of being the guy that's dependent upon everybody else doing their thing for you to do your thing. So when you're driving a car or when you're playing a guitar, you, you know, you're out in front and you control your own destiny, at least seemingly. Yeah. But so if you had the choice, car in what race you participate in? Uh, well, I mean, I think there's, I know that everybody talks about formula one, but I still think the Indy 500 is the, is the granddaddy, you know, at least for an American, it's, it's, so to be in an open wheel car and, a, and, a, you know, be coming around that last turn at Indy and see the checkered flag. I mean, that, that seems to me like that would be the greatest thrill in racing. Yeah. That was interesting. There was uh, an interview you were in uh, a couple of years ago, I believe, where you talked about how, if you had a chance, you would love to do some sort of movie, whether you write it or you star in it or act in it, uh, dealing with NASCAR. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, Days of Thunder was a good movie, I thought, and uh, Talladega Nights is a hilarious movie, but I feel like I didn't learn, you know, Days of Thunder was like a Tom Cruise movie where, you know, you feel like if he can win enough races, he'll find his dad. You know, it's it's always the same kind of feeling of those movies, and uh, and, and he does a very good job with it. I'm not trying to be critical, and Robert Duvall was amazing, obviously, um, but I feel like there's a movie about the guy trying to get on the NASCAR circuit. Like, in other words, when you don't have all the sponsors, you don't have all the money, you just have grit, you're coming off dirt tracks or, or the lower circuits, and you're just trying to break through. And, and uh, you know, like I, I did a show called Beyond the Glory. I was a narrator uh, for Fox years ago. And we did stories about like 10 or 12, you know, uh, of the most famous NASCAR drivers, you know, of that era from the 70s through the 90s. And they all seemed to have the same story. They started riding go-karts when they were little kids. They moved up to smaller sprint cars and it, but it was all like hard scrabble talent driven uh, ascent mm -hmm. you know, and, then, and then they get to a point where they they have all the, the you know the best mechanics the best equipment the sponsors and everything so i think once they're superstars like that it's not as interesting as the guys trying to break through that level so that would be the story i'd want to tell that's an interesting so, idea yeah so the guys would start out like in Irwindale and work their way up from the the entry level lower divisions and work their way through the different programs into a NASCAR. And we've seen that here in Southern California. Sure. We used to have Saugus Raceway, where a right. lot of beginners started there. And, you know, they on the hobby stock, just was the least expensive car you can get into. And then worked their way up, and a few of them made it to the top ranks of NASCAR. Well, that's funny you mentioned Saugus, because that's the track. When I did the movie I mentioned earlier, No Man's Land with Charlie Sheen, mm -hmm. they gave us two weeks on that track uh, with the stunt guys and the stunt drivers. And that was really great. Uh, that was a lot of fun teaching. But it wasn't really about, you know, it was more like about stunts, like like take a car at 50 miles an hour, uh, hit the brakes, pull the emergency brake, and do a 180, and then, pull. you know, we're doing that kind of stuff, which is pretty fun. I mean, that's yeah. fun stuff to practice. And uh, so I had two weeks of that out at Saugus. So I have great memories out there. Well, you do how to do that from being a cab driver. That looks normal. Not too hard in a checker because it's not a handbrake. You got to stomp on that thing with your left foot. <laughs> well, that's that's certainly a skill. That have you had the chance yeah. to use it recently? I mean, you know, Tennessee seems to be wide open country as far as driving. Yeah, I'm going to have to check on the statute of limitations with certain violations. <laughs> 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 absolutely true yeah uh, we were we were down in tennessee a couple of weeks ago for the uh, film festival down there and it's it's uh it's a beautiful area and uh there there are a lot of car people that are down there too people who are really into wheels i think uh ricky nelson's sons the late ricky nelson his his uh sons were down there uh yeah. and they were big car people so it's it's amazing to me how that works sometimes have you ever talked to some other actors who are into racing about racing itself in other words before you did the event up in at uh at Irwindale did you talk to anybody about how to race or tips for racing you know I I mentioned earlier I know Jason Priestley but I haven't talked to him in many years I would have reached out to him but none of my other immediate friends are into that you know I have a bunch of buddies like I mentioned that are in music uh that's what their main side hobby but no I didn't have a resource except for Swampy so you know, Swampy was very uh, helpful. You know, he, he pointed me to a couple of videos to watch and, 
you know, and just to get, get in the mode of it. But I just thought, you know, I'll just trust my reflexes and, and my insanity. Yeah. Now, you're going to go golfing. Any competition in the golf carts? You know what? i tell you what. I, one of my only useful idiot skills is if you give me a gas-powered golf cart, they're mostly electric now, but the yeah. old school gas ones are so awesome because if you take a golf tee, you can override the governor, and you can get, <laughs> you can get those things up to about 40 miles an hour, which coming over a, a wa- you know, towards a water hazard, that's real speed. Wow. Wow. That's, that's something where you're going to have to get behind the fence just to be able to watch him play a regular round of golf. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Golfing tips on talking about cars. We've got we got everything here. I mean, you just make sure you show up uh, again, and we'll have all sorts of interesting things for you. So that's pretty fun. By the way, did you know that other people who have driven cars, uh, raced cars? I was looking it up, and uh, you know, Mister Bean, Rowan Atkinson. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he is a big car guy. He actually owned a McLaren at one point. Oh wow. And here's a here's a thing that I just was really surprised about. Remember Walter Cronkite? Yeah. 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 Walter Cronkite, before he became the chief guy at CBS News, the anchor that we trusted and all that other stuff, apparently he was a race car driver. Amazing. I mean. Oh. Didn't know that. Well, next thing, James Garner liked racing, too. I remember Rockford. Yeah. He used to love racing. Right. We did find this guy together. He was a, he was a big race driver earlier and uh, a big mm-hmm. buff as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, he won, he won Baja. Right. With a uh, with an Oldsmobile of all things, I think and he still to, had it. Well, it was on display in uh, at the Mendenhall Museum up in Buellton. Okay, for a long time. He I was one of the last there. last Hollywood stars. I mean, what a great man to be around, and uh, what an example! Like, they're really not making them like him anymore. And uh, you know, it's almost like that, some of the other guys you mentioned, you know, Paul Newman and Steve McQueen. That's just a different era of Hollywood actor where. You know, guys are guys instead of now where, you know, guys are trying to be something else. Yeah, no, so, we talked about Saugus. Uh, uh, he was a regular there on Saturday nights for the, oh, okay. uh, the stock car races. And I was working crash crew there. He was uh, he was there. Uh, you know, you'd see him in the stands. He was just one of the guys. And he'd bring his stunt double with him. Oh, wow. You know, his stunt double was bringing him. I don't know which one it was. <laughs> they, were, they were always in the stands on Saturday nights watching the races. And it was... Uh, he was, you know, one of those celebrity sighting things, but he was just one of the guys when he came there, kind of like Newman was when he went uh, when he was racing the CCA. He's, uh, I'm not Paul Newman the actor. I'm just uh, one of the guys. You know, speaking of uh, uh, stunt doubles, uh, I made a movie with Peter Yates um, called Roommates, and he was the director of Bullet. And he told me a story about Steve McQueen. I was always asking him, "You got to tell me about Steve McQueen. He was one of my heroes." And so he said, "You know, the iconic scene in Bullet where he." He pulls the Mustang back and and does the squealing 180 and then flies out of the shot. It's like all one. It's a very, you know, you know, it's an iconic shot. Anyway, they did the first take of it and he comes over and and Peter Yates goes, uh, oh, that was wonderful. He's English guy. That was wonderful. Perfect. Perfect. Stephen, we're going to move on to the next shot. And McQueen goes, could you tell it was me? And and Peter Yates goes, "Um, well, I'm not sure. uh, Well, McQueen goes, let's do one more. So they do another take and McQueen does the take with his head and his arm out the window to shot <laughs> in the movie. So everybody knew it wasn't a stunt double. I thought that was genius. That's great. Yeah. That's, that's pretty neat. That's pretty neat. So what else do you have going on that we may want to talk about as far as uh, movies coming up? You talked about uh, your new one, Megalopolis. What else is coming up that you're working on? I imagine like, uh, that a lot of your audience who likes cars would also be interested in the show I narrate called Mountain Men, which uh, just starts... It just started October 3rd on History Channel, season 13. And this is about men and women that live off the grid, you know, with uh, no electricity. They make their own tools. They hunt their own food. And uh, it's just they're trappers. They're, you know, one guy, uh, um, Jake Herrick, lives in Montana. And it's illegal to kill mountain lions. They're protected in Montana, which means they're always uh, poaching, uh, you know, livestock. So he has dogs that they chase the lions back up the mountains to sort of retrain them, don't come to this ranch. So he, he and his dogs are chasing mountain lions up the hill. It's, you know, it's amazing. And uh, there's another guy in North Carolina who, who like re- resuscitated a hundred year old uh, lumber mill and he makes his own wood. You know, these guys are just, it's great. It's very escapist, you know, sort of like a simpler life. None of these guys know what an iPhone is. Uh, you know, they're just, it's great. And they're making canoes, they're doing things. And, you know, it's, it's really, really fun show. So 
It's on History Channel. There's 13 seasons of it. And the new season, I'm not saying this as of hype to be a hypey guy, but I really think it's one of the best seasons ever because they brought back one of my favorite characters, Marty Majorado, who flies a little flimsy plane into like the harshest part of the Alaskan tundra and traps animals. Like, it's like he'll fly the plane and park it and then a blizzard comes in. And the next day he's like, I hope the plane starts. Otherwise I'm going to freeze to death. And of course he's not because there's a camera crew, but he, it's creating some things that have actually happened to these guys. And there is danger. It's, you know, one guy's on the Iditarod with dog sleds. It's awesome. I really recommend people watch it. Mountain men on the history. Yeah. When you got this, did they come to you or did you hear about it and show interest in that? Or how do these things come about where you get something like that? Well, voiceovers is a very separate world from acting. And I kind of established myself in that world uh, a while ago. I was the voice of Lincoln Cars. There are those who travel and those who travel well. And then I was the voice of Bud Light for the great taste that won't fill you up and never let you down. Make it a Bud Light. And then dozens of other ones. I was the voice of the Oprah Winfrey Network. So I was kind of established at that time when Mountain Men came. And I wasn't really a big fan of reality TV. So I thought... Um, it's kind of a silly world in a way, like, cause there's a cameraman there, you know, help the guy, throw the guy a rope. But so anyway, so <laughs> I thought these mountain men, I thought I'll be the fifth mountain man. Like my voice will be like a mountain man. So I, as an actor, I thought I'll just make this character. So I started doing the voice like, um, deep in the woods of Northwest Montana. And it was kind of an over the top dumb sound, but they loved it. And the show became a hit. So now after 13 years, I'm still doing that voice even though, you know, the show has evolved and, you know, so, but it's, it's great fun. I mean, I, I love voiceovers because I grew up as, as a young actor and as a young guy, a uh, big fan of the radio, you know, Bob and Ray and comedy shows and stuff like that. So I love, you know, they say the theater of the mind. I think that's a great expression about the radio and with voiceovers, I feel like I can kind of keep that, that alive a little bit. So you envision yourself wearing a lot of plaid and dungarees and that kind of stuff <laughs> while you're doing it, right? Yeah. Very, yeah, very, very cold, just like eating some bison chili. <laughs> yeah, there you go, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. That is so great. All right, well, very good. So keep an eye out what's going on in, uh, with DB, and we thank you so much for being on the program. I, I wonder, though, are you going to get a chance to – are you going to jump on another chance to race? Absolutely. I'm hoping Swampy calls me. I didn't break any cars, so I think I'm still eligible. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think they I think you're absolutely right about that. So, again, DB Sweeney, thank you so much for joining us here, and uh, it's been great having you on the program. That'll wrap up this celebrity race edition of the Talking About Cars podcast. If you guys like today's show, how about giving us a thumbs up on YouTube when it gets there? Don't forget to follow us on social media: Facebook, Instagram, X, even LinkedIn. And don't forget to watch any of our Power to TV episodes by checking out video on demand online at WatchPTTV.com or on the Power to app. Thanks to DB Sweeney in Tennessee, Hot Rod Bob in California, and in our Washington State studios. I'm Randy Cardoon. We'll see you next time on the Talking About Cars podcast. So long, everybody. Like this show? Want more? Then head to WatchPTTV.com, the new 100% free PowerTube TV streaming network. Home of the best classic and new motorsports racing and build shows on the web.